All right, so welcome to another day of AP World History. So I'm going to put my window real quick. It's a little bit less noise. And I'll start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for another wonderful day to learn more about the world uh, that you love so much that you put your son to die. Lord, we ask that you would be with us as we study for this test and we get another chapter in. Lord, we pray all these things to glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we got two minutes. Let me see who's who. Okay, so we got the real Lynette. And then it looks like there's another Lynette joining, but maybe it's the same Lynette. All right, so right on time, Lynette, we are just beginning. So we're going to go over chapter 26 today and as efficiently and as quickly as we can. So I'm going to use this PowerPoint uh, that I found on called SlideServe. And I will poise, I couldn't download it, so I'm going to post another PowerPoint for you guys uh, on the Google Classroom so that you guys can have something of a PowerPoint. So, um, yeah, the other one yeah, I downloaded was this one, which is actually a PDF, so you can see it on your phone even. So that's the good thing about PDF is that you can see it on almost any device. All right, but I'm going to be working off this because it has nice pictures and it's well done. So uh, let's go ahead and start. So we're on chapter um, 25 in our book, although it says 26 at the top here. Um, I don't know why exactly some uh, people who made the slides, it's chapter 26 and some of these 25. But anyway, in our book, it's chapter 25, Africa and the Atlantic world. So it uh, looks like we have someone else trying to join us here. So let's see. Oh, I guess it's someone who just left. So uh, we're talking about Africa and we're talking about the Atlantic world. So a lot of this chapter is focusing on how European uh, exploration and trade and colonialism um, affected Africa. So we have the African states uh, from 1500 to 1650. And here are some of the notable uh, empires and kingdoms. So you had a kingdom uh, in sort of the northwest of Africa, not quite all the way north into the, the desert, but you have Timbuktu, you have Jenna and Gao, all part of the Songhai Empire. So the Songhai Empire, um, basically uh, took over after the Mali Empire had begun to weaken. And before the Mali Empire, you have uh, the Kingdom of Ghana. So you have three successive kingdoms, starting with the Kingdom of Ghana, which was the earliest kingdom. Uh, and it originated the Kingdom of Ghana in the fourth or fifth century, and then it established its dominance in the region in the eighth century. So after that, after um, after that empire kind of weaned and weakened, you had the Mali Empire take over. Okay. So uh, Josh is joining us. That's what that sound is. So in the 13th century, the Mali Empire replaced Ghana as the preeminent power in West Africa. But the Mali rulers continued the Ghana policy of controlling the trans-Saharan trade. So 
these kingdoms up in the north were uh, controlling the trade that went across the Sahara Desert in caravans, right? So, which brought a lot of money. In fact, some of the richest kings in the world, and in fact, as far as we know, the richest king who ever lived, um, lived in this area and controlled the, the trans-Saharan trade. So, the Songhai Empire started with, let me switch over slides here. Songhai Empire um, began in the 15th century, so like the 1400s. So early in the 15th century, they rejected the Mali authority and they mounted raids deep into Mali territory. So you have the state, which is the Songhai Kingdom, and it's expanding and it goes into Mali territory. Mali territory. So in 1464, Songhe ruler Sunni Ali reigned in 1464 to 1493, and they embarked on a campaign to conquer its neighbors and consolidated the Songhe Empire. And so he brought the important trade cities of Timbuktu and Jene under his control, and their wealth continued to dominate the central Niger Valley. So, uh, Lynette just sent me a message saying that her internet is slow, so I'm going to keep an eye out for her. She wants to join. So, Sunni Ali, he um, strengthened his military. He created an effective army and navy, and uh, they had musket bearing Moroccan armies that uh, eventually destroyed the Songhe forces and then regional city-states began to exert local control. So this is kind of what you see happening over and over in this period of Africa is you have these kingdoms, they get bigger, some of them turn into empires, and then you had some foreign power come in that kind of divided and undermined the, the African empires there. And then, um, and then you have these local governments that started to try to, you know, basically weaken the empire. So kind of like what we saw in India, where you had attempts to try to make an empire in northern India, uh, but these empires were very weak, and it was mostly all about like the local princes and kings who had control. And so, um, so instead of having a big empire. Uh, these empires start disintegrating into more local uh, forms of uh, political centers. So let's go on to the next part. All right, so you have Swahili decline in East Africa. So as as the Portuguese go into East Africa, uh, you begin seeing them trade. And in 1505, you have massive Portuguese and naval ex expeditions that subdued all of the Swahili cities from Sofala to Mombasa. And the Portuguese forces built administrative centers in Mozambique and Malandi. Uh, and constructed forts throughout the region in hopes of controlling uh, trade in East Africa. They did not succeed in that effort, but they disrupted trade patterns enough to send the Swahili cities into a decline from which they never really fully recovered. So East Africa, as we know, had had some pretty sophisticated cultures that built like all kinds of stone towers and castles and, and um, and dwellings and stuff like that. Um, and they got pretty rich from trade with India uh, because remember India was trading with both East Asia and Africa. And um, so the Swahili city-states became pretty powerful, but then when the Portuguese came in, they kind of ruined it all uh, by trying to control the trade in that area. And that was the Portuguese way of doing things, right? We saw that in Southeast Asia, where the Portuguese were trying to 
control on the trade that went uh, through that area, through Indonesia and and so forth. And so, and anybody who was not um, any ship that was trying to trade was supposed to stop at these ports and pay like these taxes to the Portuguese. And so that's kind of their thing. They want to control trade. They want to tax all the trade that goes on in there. Uh, but of course the Portuguese failed because they didn't have enough people, right? So they just didn't have um, the kind of manpower they needed to control all the trades. So although they tried to control the trade, they weren't entirely successful. So, so let's look at the uh, kingdoms of Central Africa and South Africa. All right, so in Central Africa, we have the, the Congo area, right? So there's a big river, the Congo River, that uh, goes into uh, the ocean and the Atlantic. The Portuguese were able to sail up some ships there and to try to control and set up trade uh, and forts in that area to control the river. So what happens here is the Portuguese were trying to spread Christianity. This was um, the, the king of Portugal's dream was to spread Christianity throughout Africa to combat Islam. And one of the kings, King Nzinga um, Mbemba, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, he actually is known to us as Alfonso the I guess he gets like a Christian name. He converts to Christianity and um, the Congolese, the people who are in this area, uh, believe that if they convert to Christianity, it'll produce uh, peaceful and useful connections with the Portuguese interests. And so, um, so he becomes very zealous. In fact, he reads the Bible so much that he actually um, neglects to eat. He becomes a very zealous convert and attempts to convert a population at large. Uh, now, the, what typically happens uh, in Africa is that when Africans convert to Christianity, a lot of uh, them uh, syncretize their religion and syncretization or a syncretic religion is one that tries to um, incorporate other religions into it to just to blend uh, different religious beliefs together or maybe religious beliefs with other religious practices from other religions. So, um, so African Christianity um, oftentimes contains elements of, of um, pagan ritual tribes and um, like, for example, if we take the saints of Christianity, they all have, each saint has like its own special thing, right? Its own special power that, that if you pray to them, they'll help you with this special thing. Well, it's very similar to the gods of the Africans who all had special realms in which if you had a problem in this realm, you would pray to this god. And if you had a problem in this situation, you pray to that different god. Uh, who specializes in this situation. So, um, so that's what's going on here with um, this African uh, syncretization. So you have slave raiding in the Congo. So the Portuguese initiate attempts at slave raiding and soon it's discovered that it's easier to trade weapons for slaves that were provided by African traders. So. African traders would actually go and get the slaves and bring them to the Portuguese with whom they would trade for like weapons and other valuable things that the Portuguese had. So, and they dealt with the uh, several authorities besides the Congo. Congo kings appealed without success to slow uh, down, but they couldn't eliminate the slave trade. Um, so, Eventually, relations deteriorate and the Portuguese attack the Com Congo and they decapitate the king in 1665. And so this um, improved the, the slave market does develop in the south. So 
Okay. So now we have the kingdom of the Dongo in Angola. And the Dongo gains wealth and independence from Congo by means of Portuguese slave trade. So this came up. Ndongo gains wealth and independence from the Congo by means of Portuguese slave trade, but the Portuguese influence that was resisted by Queen Mzinga posed a threat to Portuguese dominance. So uh, she was a very interesting woman. She tried to be as powerful as a male king, or at least to be perceived as powerful as a male king, because um, although African women tended to have more power and freedom than most cultures in the world. Um, they sometimes considered a queen as still weaker than a king. So she posed as a male king. She dressed like a man. She asked to be referred to as a king instead of queen. And she even walked around with male concubines, surrounded by male concubines, who were dressed in females' clothing. So, um, Nzinga establishes a temporary alliance with the Dutch in an unsuccessful attempt to expel the Portuguese. And then uh, there was a decline in the Dongo power after her death. So, so it looks like the Portuguese win this round uh, again. So, Regional kingdoms in South Africa. So chieftains developed a trade with the Swahili city-states and in the 1300s, the great Zimbabwe. Uh, city was created and it was a massively built city in 1300. And it was near the city of Nianda in modern Zimbabwe. And they dominated the gold bearing plain between the Zande, uh, Zandezi and the Limpopo rivers until the 15th century. So Europeans arrive in South Africa. You have the Dutch who built a trading post of Cape Town in 1652, and they encountered the hunting and gathering. Koi, Koi people, whom they referred to as the Hottentots. So the, with the aid of firearms, they claimed the lands for themselves and commandeered the Kokoi uh, labor with relative ease. So by 1700, the large numbers of Dutch colonists had begun to arrive in South Africa. And by mid-century, they established settlements through the region bounded by the Orange and Great Fish Rivers. Their conquests laid the foundation for a series of Dutch and British colonies, which eventually became the most prosperous European possessions in the Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is typically what you see going on here is Portuguese get to some place first, and then the Dutch come, and they start getting in the mix there. And then eventually the English uh, kick out the Portuguese and the Dutch um, or if the Portuguese replace the Dutch, they just kick out the Dutch. So to this day, uh, South Africa is, is still, <clears throat> it's an independent colony, but it speaks English because there's a lot of English people or people of English descent who live there. All right, so now we're gonna see some pictures of Cape Town from the mountains, a beautiful, beautiful city. Um, you see it's kind of like, has this peninsula that kind of wraps around. And you have these like really tall mountains. All right, so now we're gonna talk about Islam and Christianity in early modern Africa. So indigenous religions made uh, influential throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and in early modern times. Although many African peoples recognize a supreme remote creator God, they devoted most of their attention to powerful spirits who were thought to intervene directly in human affairs. So African peoples associated many of these spirits with prominent geographic features like such as mountains, waters, and forests. And they thought um, of 
of uh, the living dead, spirits of ancestors who roam the world, not only uh, distributing rewards to descendants who led worthy lives and will honor the memories of their departed kin, but also meeting out punishments for those who did not. So uh, kind of like in China, you have um, ancestor worship and you have to please uh, your dead ancestors and you must remember them and honor them. And these kind of acted like gods or like spirit guides uh, for you. So you would oftentimes ask your ancestors to guide you in, in affairs, uh, which is what you saw a lot of in in the uh, Black Panther movie. So, so um, the Fulani people uh, probably become the most uh, intensely devoted people to the Islamic religion. They, there was a movement in their culture to impose strict adherence to Islamic norms in Africa. And by 1680, they begin military campaigns to enforce Sharia law in West Africa. And if we remember Sharia laws, like Islamic law. Uh, so there is considerable influence that extends to the South as well. So the Fulani were located in Sub-Saharan Africa. All right, so just like I explained, Christianity in Sub-Saharan Africa um, oftentimes had syncretic uh, African beliefs. Uh, African Islam also sometimes had syncretic um, evolutions, I guess you could say it evolved uh, to incorporate um, some African beliefs. All right, so let's talk about the Antonian movement. So a particularly influential syncretic cult was the Antonian movement in Congo, which flourished in the early 18th century when the Congolese monarchy faced challenges throughout the realm. The Antonian movement began in 1704 when an aristocratic woman named Donna Beatrice claimed that Saint Anthony of Padua had possessed her and chosen her to communicate his messages. So. St. Anthony was a 13th century Franciscan missionary and popular preacher born in Lisbon. And uh, St. Anthony died near Padua in Italy. So where his followers built a large church in his honor. And he was a, extremely popular among the Portuguese Christians who introduced his cult to Congo. And Donna Beatrice gained a reputation for working miracles and curing diseases and she used her preeminence to promote an African form of Christianity. She also taught that Jesus Christ had been a black African man and that the Congo was uh, the true holy land of Christianity and that heaven was for Africans. So she urged the Congolese to ignore European missionaries and heed her, uh, her disciples instead. And she sought to harness the widespread popular interest in her teachings and use it to the end to end the wars that were plaguing Congo. So Donna Beatrice's movement was a serious challenge to Christian missionaries in Congo. And in 1706, they persuaded King Pedro IV of Congo to arrest the charismatic prophetess in suspicion of heresy. Upon examining her, the missionaries satisfied themselves that Donna Beatrice was a false prophet and that she knowingly taught false doctrine. On their recommendations, the royal government sentenced her to death and burned her at the stake. Yet the Antonian movement did not disappear. Donna Beatrice's disciples continued to work in to strengthen the monarchy and reconstruct Congolese society. And in 1708, an army of almost 20,000 Antonians challenged King Pedro, whom they considered an unworthy ruler. And their efforts illustrate clearly that the tendency of Congolese Christians to fashion a faith that reflected their own needs and concerns, as well as the interests of European missionaries. So throughout history, you see people using religion, uh, using Christianity to kind of suit their own needs, using Islam to suit their own needs. Um, and here's just an example of um, people using Christianity 
to kind of suit their political needs. So um, foundations of the slave trade. So, so we know that Columbus uh, was probably the first person to suggest um, using Africans as slaves. Uh, there's a letter uh, that was written by Columbus that said that the Indians uh, were not really good workers and that uh, probably the people who were best suited for this kind of tropical atmosphere and that were strong and hard workers were the Africans. And so, um, so that's how the slave trade began. And African slavery dates to antiquity. There have always been slaves. Um, typically, the Africans uh, would enslave other Africans uh, when they went to war. Uh, they would take captives and enslave them. They would also uh, make criminals uh, to forced labor, so they would enslave criminals. And then anybody who was expelled from a clan uh, was oftentimes Uh, put in chains and uh, was a slave. So, um, so Europeans didn't invent African slavery. African slavery started with Africans in Africa, uh, but the Europeans definitely did exploit this system, this institution. Now, European slavery at this time was different than African slavery. Um, so typically in Africa, you weren't born into slavery. And there were ways that you could get out of slavery. You, know, you weren't a slave for life. And neither were your children. If you were maybe a slave, uh, didn't necessarily mean that if you had children, that your children would be slaves. So, um, so Africans didn't tend to have a strong, um, what would you say, a, a strong view that there was private property. In other words, most of what you own uh, was shared with the tribe or the group or the family or the clan. And uh, whereas um, private property in European eyes was something that was like a right, you know, that you had a right to own your things and you could do with your things whatever you wanted. Okay, if you bought something, it's yours, you have full control over it. Okay, uh, sharing, um, community resources was more of the African way of thinking about it. So slaves oftentimes were assimilated into an owner's clan in, in Africa. So you kind of became part of their society. Um, and so different than uh, European way of thinking where you're kind of sort of separate element from society. You're just, you're just a tool of of society, but you don't really belong to white society or European society. So the Islamic slave trade um, began with a dramatic expansion of slave trade in, uh, with Arab traders. These new slaves were acquired by raiding villages and selling on the Swahili coast. Af uh, Arab traders depended on African infrastructure to maintain the supply of slaves. And European demand on the West Coast causes demand to rise again. So the demand and the cost of slaves uh, began to increase because everybody wanted slaves, everybody wanted workers. Um, so, so the early slave trade uh, began mostly in the West Coast in 1441 and the Portuguese take 12 men. Uh, initially, they're met with stiff resistance. Uh, African dealers, however, were ready to provide slaves. In 1460, uh, about 500 slaves per year were sold to work as miners, and porters, and domestic servants in Spain and Portugal. And by 1520, 2,000 per year are taken to work in sugarcane plantations in the Americas. So once sugarcane uh, became established as a money-making crop, that's when slavery really exploded. Um, the slave trade, I should say, the Atlantic slave trade really uh, took off and exploded. 
So there's a thing called triangular trade. And if you've taken a US history class, you've probably seen this. And this basically was a system of trade where uh, you had like manufactured products brought from Europe to the Americas and West Indies and uh, even Africa. And they were traded for raw goods that came from the New World or slaves that came from Africa. So uh, sometimes you would take these raw goods back to Europe to be made into uh, processed uh, goods, manufactured goods. So maybe you take the wood from North America to build ships in England, um, or you would, you know, take spices or something like that sugar from the West Indies to make something else um, in Europe. So um, African slaves were purchased and sent to the Americas, okay, and then cash crops were purchased in the Americas and returned to Europe. So this is sort of this triangle between Europe, the Americas, and Africa. So you have this middle passage and the African slaves were captured by raiding parties and were forced to march uh, to holding pens on the coast. So, uh, so usually Africans were being employed or maybe they were working for themselves um, to capture slaves so that they could bring to the Portuguese and get some goods in exchange. So, So the middle passage um, took about four to six weeks. So this is traveling over the ocean, and this was horrible, uh, horrific conditions, being chained to the bottom of a boat, in really cramped conditions, barely any food. Uh, people started getting sick very easily, and um, often over 50% of the people died. Okay, so the mortality rate was really, really high, uh, but it eventually declined to about 5%. So somehow they figured out a way, um, a healthier way, I guess you could say, of bringing um, Africans overseas uh, so that the, most of them wouldn't die off um, like what seemed to be happening earlier. So. Uh, the total slave traffic between the 15th and 18th centuries was 12 million, and approximately 4 million died before the arrival. So that is quite a bit of people who died. So here we see graphs uh, from the 16th century, the 17th century, to the 18th century, and we see a dramatic increase in slave export per year. But, um, we do see eventually the slave trade is ended, but let's talk first about the, the impact of the slave trade on African regions. So what are the social effects of the slave trade? Well, you have some groups in Rwanda, um, Ganda, Maasai, the Turkana, they resist the slave trade. Um, You have some that benefit from the distance uh, of the slave ports on the western coast. Other societies benefit from the slave profit, like the Ashanti, the Domi, the Oyo peoples. Um, I went to Ghana, and the, the main ethnic tribe tribal group is the Ashanti people. Uh, but you also have the total African population expanding due to the importation of American crops. So, uh, American crops uh, bring a lot of nutritious food to the Africans, and so you actually have population boom in Africa. Um, now, you also have um, a negative effect of, of the slave trade, is you have millions of captured Africans removed from society. And this depleted regional populations, and in fact, because most of slaves that were coming over from Africa were male, you had a lot of communities in Africa where there wasn't a lot of men. And so you had distorted sex, rat sex ratios where you have 
two thirds of the slaves that, uh, that were male are taken and they're gone. Most of them being from 14 to 35 years of age. And so you had all these women left over in these communities in Africa. So there was a lot more women in a lot of communities in Africa than men. So this meant that these women were now marrying, um, many women were marrying uh, one man. And so this encouraged polygamy amongst Africans. And so the, the men in Africa got greedy and they're like, look, there's all these women and they have no husbands. Well, I'm rich, so I can afford a lot of these wives. And, you know, so this encouraged polygamy. So polygamy uh, increased in Africa. Um, you also had women, uh, this is a very interesting development, women acting in traditionally male roles. So if there's not enough male governing or leadership, uh, women have to step in. And so, um, so we see that in Africa, uh, a lot of women historically had more powerful positions or, um, or elevated roles than around the world, but this even increases more. So political effects of the slave trade, well, with the introduction of firearms, arms, this increases the violence of pre-existing conflicts. So more people can die because guns are more powerful and deadly than traditional um, non-firearm weapons. So more weapons means more slaves, more slaves uh, leads to even more weapons. And the Dahomey uh, create a army dedicated to the slave trade. Okay, so here you, you see some brands. They're used to brand slaves. They, they make them um, red hot. They put them in a fire and then they stick them on your skin. And now you have like this permanent scar with your slave owner's name on there. All right, so African slaves in plantation societies so what was that like? So most slaves were working in tropical and subtropical regions. So in the Americas, you think of the South, it's like a subtropical region. Uh, you see this in the Caribbean, in Brazil. Okay, so that's where slave, uh, most of the slave populations uh, went to in the Americas. And they were intentionally brought there because they thought, okay, well, Africans live in this kind of um, environment at home in Africa, so they'd be perfect for working in these conditions. Also, it's because sugarcane required a lot of horrible labor um, that the Europeans just didn't want to do, and they figured, oh, well, you know, sugarcane grows in these kind of tropical climates anyway, and these Africans are from this tropical climate, so this is a perfect uh, matching of resources together with crops. Um, so the first plantation was established in Hispaniola, which is now Haiti or the Dominican Republic um, in 1516. But later on, they were created in Mexico, Brazil, Caribbean, and the Americas. So sugar was a major cash crop. But later on, they had tobacco, rice, indigo, cotton, coffee. Uh, plantations and plantations depended on heavy, uh, they depended heavily on slave labor. So there were racial divisions of labor that were created. Um, you had some regional differences between um, Caribbean, South America. You had an African population that was unable to make maintain numbers through natural means because Africans uh, kept dying um, because of malaria and yellow fever that was all carried by mosquitoes in these tropical areas where there's lots of stagnant water. You had brutal working conditions, sanitation, nutrition. There was a gender imbalance, so there wasn't enough women to have kids um, to bring mostly male slaves. So typically you would lose more people to um, to death and disease uh, in the slave population than, than they were creating uh, by procreating. So um, 
So this was a terrible experience for, uh, for African slaves. And there was a constant importation of slaves that had to come in and replace those slaves that were dying in these conditions. In North America, you had less disease and um, a more normal uh, sex ratio. So they were bringing uh, more women, um, not as much men dominating that ratio. So, um, so slave families were encouraged because they needed to replace the slaves um, that either were dying or the um, or because a big deal, because in the uh, 1800s, you also have the ending of the slave trade from England. So for example, in America, when the slave, English slave trade ended, the Americans weren't able to get any more slaves from Africa. So they had to uh, basically raise their own slaves from birth by encouraging slaves to have families and to have kids so that their kids could be their slaves when they get older. So um, once the slave trade end, ended in Africa, Americans became desperate to get slaves by means of uh, families, slaves having families and procreating. So um, there were some slave revolts. Uh, they were unusual. Slave revolts were unusual because whenever there were uh, revolts, uh, they were crushed and people that were participating in it were usually tortured and killed and mutilated. And, and so, um, so as you can imagine, if those are the consequences, you're probably not likely going to re uh, revolt. But there were some, uh, there's really only one successful um, uh, revolt. Uh, and that happened in the French controlled Saint Dominique. Okay, which was renamed Haiti. So you have um, famous general, uh, I think it was Louis Toussaint. Hopefully I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He actually led a successful slave revolt and kicked out the French out of Haiti. And uh, they created a, a republic. And um, Europeans freaked out when they heard about this. When they saw that this one successful slave revolt was successful, Americans in the South were terrified that the slaves would one day rise up and revolt in a similar fashion. And that was sort of a white slave owner's worst fear is that their slaves would turn against them because typically slaves outnumbered um, slave owners. But uh, slave populations in America did not outnumber the white population. So that was one reason probably why uh, a successful slave revolt never happened in the Americas. All right, so uh, with the exception, of course, of um, the Haitian uh, slave revolt. All right, so um, just an in interesting side note about the Haitian slave revolt. Uh, when the Haitians set up their own government um, and ended slavery there, uh, they had representatives that were sent uh, all throughout the Americas for a huge convention of American leaders, like Latin American and North American leaders. And uh, the Americans refused to send a, a delegation, the United States refused to send a, a delegation because they knew that they would be sitting uh, at the same table on equal terms with uh, black slaves who had freed themselves and had become uh, leaders of the country. And so they were so, these racist uh, Americans were so offended by, by that that they refused to go to this convention because they didn't want to sit in equal um, fashion with uh, people who were formerly slaves. So the abolition of slavery occurred um, because of several uh, movements. And some of them were Christian movements. Um, some of them were um, enlightenment movements. And some of them were movements that were caused by uh, former slaves. So for example, we have um, Alada Equiano, 
from 1745 to 1797. And he was a slave, he was a former slave, and he wrote a book. He wrote an autobiography of his life as a slave, and he created very eloquent attacks on the institution of slavery. So a lot of people read his book and became very convinced about how slavery is an evil institution and needs to be abolished. Um, another thing that contributed to the movement to abolish slavery is that the price of slaves was increasing. Um, there's a lot of military expenses that were um, used to prevent rebellions and this added up to a lot of money uh, because if you're keeping all these people against their will, you're gonna need a lot of force and a lot of money and a lot of weapons to do that, so it's expensive. In the 18th uh, century, uh, the price of sugar falls. Um, not sure why it falls, but probably it's because so many people are producing sugar that it becomes cheaper and cheaper. And this combined with the price of uh, slaves, um, you know, just doesn't make slavery as much profitable as it used to be. So wage labor becomes even more uh, efficient. So wage earners can spend income on manufactured goods. So, so there's a lot of economic reasons to abolish slavery. Um, and that's what a lot of people believe that um, was the source of the British choosing to uh, end the slave trade because a lot of British people thought that slave wage was, was undermining the English worker. And so a lot of people who were in the labor movement in England didn't want to have to complete the slave labor. And um, it was becoming more expensive anyway. So, uh, so there was a lot of practical reasons to end the slave trade besides the fact that it was completely immoral, and such a horrible institution. So Denmark, uh, it's the first to abolish the slave trade in 1803, and then Great Britain follows in 1807. Uh, William Wilberforce is like one of the big champions of ending the slave uh, trade in Great Britain. Uh, with that, the US ends also the slave trade in 1808, uh, France in 1814, the Netherlands in 1817, and then Spain in 1845. However, we still have slavery continuing in places like the United States until 1865. So um, the possession of slaves remains legal, but um, the slave trade is mostly uh, illegal. So now there were clandestine, uh, clandestine um, trades, like in other words, undercover trade that continues until 1867. But you have the emancipation of uh, slaves beginning with the British colonies in 1833, then the French colonies in 1848. The US had a civil war, which ended uh, slavery in 1865. And then Brazil was like the last country to end slavery in its ter territory in 1888. So uh, Saudi Arabia and Angola continue uh, slavery even all the way up until the 1960s. So um, slavery didn't end around the world, you know, um, when the Americans ended slavery, but because um, it continued. In fact, slaves, slavery still continues to this day. In fact, there are more slaves now that exist on planet Earth than there was, you know, before slavery was abolished in the U.S. So, uh, but a lot of this is underground. Um, Europeans did push in um, Asian colonies to end slavery. So for example, um, there's a famous lady from England, famous teacher who taught the king of Thailand's uh, sons. Uh, and uh, he, she was able to persuade the king to eventually end slavery um, yeah, in Thailand. So. Um, Christians have ended slavery several times throughout history, um, although slavery did pop up again throughout Christendom, um, or throughout the Christian Western Hemisphere several times. So it's kind of an evil that's hard to kill. It just kind of keeps popping up over and over again. 
and even today in California, we still have a lot of um, sex slaves and also like uh, people who are like working in like sweatshops, like in places in LA and stuff like that. And Mexico, there's still like sweatshops. And throughout Asia, there are sweatshops everywhere. A lot of people criticize Nike shoes for having sweatshops in Asia, like Indonesia and places like that. Um, where Nikes are made. And so slavery still continues to this day, although it's considered mostly illegal in most countries. However, in Africa, I believe there is still some legal slavery going on in some uh, countries. So uh, in some particularly Muslim regions of Africa. So um, but I'd have to double check on that. I'm not completely sure about that. So, um, Anyway, so that finishes up the chapter 26 uh, right on time, it looks like. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to email me. But uh, I'll let you go, and I'll post up this video as soon as it uploads. So probably in a couple hours, maybe two or three hours, I'll post the video up on the link when it's done uploading to YouTube. All right, I'll see you guys later. Um, have a good one.